Hello, Community West Church. We're back online with you again. In fact, you can see they've set up a new screen thing here. It says Community West Church welcomes you to church online. A um, couple of things. We've made a couple of changes to how we're setting up the um, um, process of doing this, and I think it's going to work out a lot better. And also, it looks like our setup is, is doing quite um, it makes it easier for me to be able to talk to you guys and I can't stand up and walk around like I like to do but this is um, really enjoyable for me to be able to sit and talk and, and share the message with you so before we get started I want to remind you about scripture reading we've got a um, planning center has the scriptures that we should be reading and I'll be looking ahead to adding the additional scriptures as we um, reach the end of where we are right now and then be sure to submit prayer requests to uh, communitywest.com Pastor Vicki manages that and she will take care of how those things are done communitywestchurch at gmail.com oh okay I think I left out a couple things it's communitywestchurch at gmail.com um, earlier I wrote communitywest.com I'll repeat that. Community West Church, one word, at gmail.com. Third thing is announcements. If you have things that you want to announce for your departments or things that are going on, um, like family social or get togethers with, what are we calling it, uh, social distancing and such, um, you can um, announce that. We can help you to announce that for family get together or whatever. Um, can't think of anything else. So let's get into the message. And before we do, I'd like to pray. Heavenly Father, I hope that uh, in our preparation and in our um, putting all these things together that we haven't overlooked your hand on us, keeping us safe and guiding us. We pray that you will continue to be with us and minister to us and influence us and especially um, give us those uh, reassurances that eventually these things will pass. We pray also that as you um, touch us and lead us and guide us that you will also um, inspire us to do more than what we feel like we could do. And we pray in Jesus' name. So we're continuing the Holy Bible series. This is part two. It's a five-part series. First part was, anybody? Inspiration. Nobody knows. Okay. Ins oh, I got it from the audience here. Inspiration. Okay, good. Second part is today, canonization. It's nothing to do with war. It's about how our scriptures were chosen. Now, our text for this message, oddly enough, is Revelation 22, but I thought it was very fitting. You'll see in just a moment. I'm going to read through Revelation 22 here as soon as my screen catches up. Revelation 22, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. The angel said to me, These words are trustworthy and true. He's speaking to John. The Lord, the God who inspires the prophets, sent his angel to show his servants the things that must soon take place. Look, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy written in this scroll. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who had been showing them to me. But he said to me, Don't do that. I am a fellow servant with you and with your fellow prophets and with all who keep the words of this scroll. Worship God. 
Then he told me, Do not seal up the words of the prophecy of the scroll, because the time is near. Let the one who does wrong continue to do wrong. Let the vile person continue to be vile. Let the one who does right continue to do right. And let the holy person continue to be holy. In the epilogue, it's an invitation and a warning. Look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. Outside are the dogs, those who practice magic arts, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, Come, and let the one who hears say, Come, let the one who is thirsty come, and let the one who wishes take the free gift of the water of life. So I'm going to stop here to introduce the message, and then we'll continue. Last week we investigated the inspiration for writing the books of the Holy Bible, and we answered the question, where did the Bible come from? Today's message, part two, will reveal how the scriptures were chosen. Our focus is on Revelation chapter 22, and a significant and profoundly serious decision. Which books would be in the Bible, and which books would not? Now last week I told you where and how we got our scriptures, and that scripture is inspired by God. This week in part two, we will answer this question. How did we get this book? How did the Bible, breathed out by God, make its way from the writer's desk into this book? First, it's important to remember that the Bible is not just one book. We carry it as one book. But the Bible is a collection of 66 books bound together in one cover. Which leads us to this particularly important question. Who decided which books were in? and which books were out. To help us understand this, we turn to Revelation 22, verse 18. Now this passage announces a strong caution regarding the selection of what would be scripture and what would not be scripture. Starting in verse 18, John writes, I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this scroll. If anyone adds anything to them, God will add to that person the plagues described in this scroll. And if anyone takes words away from the scroll of prophecy, God will take away from that person any share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this scroll. He who testifies to this thing says, Yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. So many of you already know that the book of Revelation, excuse me, the book of Revelation was spoken from Jesus to the Apostle John when John was in exile on the Isle of Patmos. The book of Revelation prophetically predicts the end of times, the future of the church, and the final and future coming of God's kingdom. In Revelation, we have the final words that were spoken by Jesus to John. It is a strong caution. It could be summarized this way. John, you need to tell people about the prophecy of this book, the scripture, that they should not add to the revelation. If they do, the plagues described in Revelation will come upon you. And similarly, just as you should not add anything to God's word, you should not subtract anything from God's word. Because, Jesus says to John, if you subtract or reduce God's revelation, then God will subtract from you, or will reduce from you, the share that you have in the tree of life and in God's holy city in the future. Now, a close study of this passage reveals two conclusions. The first conclusion is that we must be careful not to trifle with God's word. I cannot tell you that I know what the plague looks like for someone who disobeys God's word, but I am certain it's not pleasant. As to the other penalty, taking away any share in the tree of life, I believe that means that the promised eternal life has some caveats, which if you disobey or violate, eliminate your acceptance into eternal life. We do not need to know anything more than this. Do not trifle with God's word neither add nor subtract from the scripture. A second observation that I see in this passage is that God's scripture, his word, 
has a well-defined and certain boundary. You cannot add or take away from something that is indefinite. How do you add to infinity? How do you subtract from infinity? You cannot do it. The only way that Jesus could command this caution to John and generations that would follow is that there must be an understanding that God's Word, His revelation, has noticeably clear and distinguishable boundaries. That's the only way we could follow the command of neither adding nor subtracting from God's revelation. I believe that the words Jesus speaks here are specifically about the book of Revelation. There is both historical and grammatical reason to believe this is so. There are other passages throughout Scripture that say a similar thing. For example, in Deuteronomy 4, verse 2, Moses tells the people, Do not add to what I command you, and do not subtract from it, but keep the commands of the Lord your God that I give you. Or consider what Solomon writes in Proverbs chapter 30. Verses 5 and 6. Every word of God is flawless. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words, or he will rebuke you and prove you a liar. This theme running through the Bible makes it clear that God's word has distinguishable boundaries and that we, as God's people, must be careful to neither add nor subtract from what is clearly delineated as God's holy word. And that leads me to this question. How do we know what is God's word? In other words, how do we know that the Bible that we hold in our hands is no less and no more than God's Word? Throughout history, people have argued about whether these 66 books are really God's final word. In the 1990s, a group of pseudo-intellectuals came together and debated whether or not Jesus said the things that he said and did the things that he did. They called themselves the Jesus Seminar. If you're not familiar with that term, pseudo-intellectuals, it means a person or a person's exhibiting intellectual pretensions that have no basis in sound scholarship. They sat around tables voting about these things based on their opinion of whether someone could actually say those things. They do not believe very much of what is said about Jesus in the Gospel. They were known in ancient times but have resurfaced and people have taken quite an interest in them. These include... Oh, did I skip that page here? Make sure. No. Nope making sure it seemed like I jumped there. They were known in ancient times, but have resurfaced and people have taken quite an interest in them. These include the Gospel of Mary, the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Judas, the secret Gospel of Mark, and other writings. What do we do with those writings? And what are we to do about other religions and other groups who call their scriptures sacred? What do you do with the Quran or the Book of Mormon? Two very large groups of believers who claim that God has spoken to them and that they possess documents equal to or greater than the scripture that we claim is God's word. What do we do with that? How do we know that what we have today is the right word of God, no more and no less? First up, a history lesson on the canonization of scripture. To help us understand this, I want to give you a little lesson here on the history of how the collection or the collation of the scriptures that we have today, the 66 books that we have in our Bible, were put together. Now, the Old Testament is made up of 39 books, and those books record history from the time of the creation of the world, from Adam, through to about 400 base B.C., when Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, the last three prophets in the Old Testament, added their prophecies to the Old Testament. It took about a thousand years for the Old Testament to be written. Their documentation covers about 4,000 years of world history, which leads us to this the authenticity, authenticity of the Old Testament. Now, there was never any real debate or concern about the 39 books that make up our Old Testament. There was widespread acceptance among the Jews for the 39 books, including the law spoken by Moses, also known as the Torah, the prophets and historical books, and also the wisdom literature and poetic books. To the Jews, they were indeed the Word of God. They were Scripture. In the New Testament, Jesus quotes from 24 of the Old Testament books, and 36 of the Old Testament books are mentioned throughout the New Testament. The New Testament writers had a clear understanding of what was Scripture, God's law. In 90 AD, a group of Jewish rabbis, rabbis, scribes, and scholars came together to put the final stamp on what we know as Scripture. It was called the Council of Jamnia, or was it? In his best-selling novel, The Da Vinci Code, Dan Brown wrote that the Bible was assembled during the famous 
Council of Nicaea in 325 CE, Christian year, when Emperor Constantine and church authorities purportedly banned problematic books that didn't conform to their secret agenda. Except none of that is true. Brown was not the first to credit the Council of Nicaea with deciding which books to include in the Bible. In the 18th century, Voltaire repeated a centuries-old myth that the Bible was canonized in Nicaea by placing all the known books on a table, saying a prayer, and seeing which illegitimate texts fell to the floor. Would have loved to have watched that. The truth is, there was no single church authority or council that convened to put a rubber stamp on the biblical canon, the official list of the books of the Bible. Not at Nicaea or anywhere else in antiquity, according to Jason Combs, an assistant professor at Brigham Young University who specializes in ancient Christianity. The Council of Nicaea did take place, but it was convened to resolve a religious matter unrelated to the books of the Bible. The other theory, that the Council of Jamnia finalized the canon of scripture, was first proposed by Heinrich Graz in 1871 and remained popular for much of the 20th century. However, it was increasingly questioned from the 1960s onward and the theory has been largely discredited. Up to this point, oral tradition had taken the scriptures forward in the community, but there had never been a final declaration or a gold seal, if you will, stating these 39 books as the Old Testament as the Word of God. The Council of Jamnia may also have been uh, the occasion when the Jewish authorities decided to exclude believers in Jesus as the Messiah from synagogue attendance, as referenced by interpretations of John 9.22. John 9.22, his parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders, who already had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. So to put this statement in place, it came right after Jesus healed a blind man, which raised a significant number of eyebrows among the Jewish leaders. The Council of Jamnia canonized the Old Testament scripture. The word canon, by the way, means uh, measuring or rule. The Council of Jamnia did not declare the 39 books of the Old Testament to be canon. They did not decide and grant authority to any of those books. Those books were rule and law and authoritative the moment God spoke the words from his mouth. I'll give you an analogy. When Michelangelo crafted the Sistine Chapel, when did the Sistine Chapel become a masterpiece? Did it become a masterpiece the moment it was painted? Or did it become a masterpiece only when people saw it? Well, it was a masterpiece the moment it was painted. It took people a while to recognize its work. And in the same way, the moment that God spoke the scriptures to human beings throughout the Holy Spirit, those words were canon. They were it. They were a masterpiece. They were rule and they were authoritative. The councils that followed later simply needed to discover that. They needed to understand and discern which books were canonical and which books were not. The Council of Jamnia, operating with several uh, criteria, was able to discern and agree that these 39 books were considered God's law and canon up to that point. Now the Old Testament ends with prophetic words from Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. Interestingly, there is a passage in Malachi in which the prophet predicts that the next prophet who would speak would be somebody who comes in the spirit of Elijah. The Old Testament comes to an end, and guess what? For 400 years, everything goes silent. God does not speak. There is no prophecy given. There is no revelation that is revealed. All goes silent. There were several who began to write some documents during this time, but there were no scriptures written during this time until we get to the New Testament. Now, the New Testament reflects a time period of about 60 to 90 years, and it includes the birth, life, and teachings of Jesus, the growth of his early church, and the writings of the apostles during that time, helping the church to become established. It's interesting what you find in the New Testament. Jesus refers to the Old Testament as Scripture. Paul refers to the words of Jesus as Scripture. Peter refers to the words of Paul as Scripture. And Jude references the writings of Peter as scripture. So they're all in line. They are all supporting the others. They are showing respect to one another. They point to one another, the writers who document the very words of God. Do not let a movie or a so-called documentary tell you otherwise. There was little debate in the early church as to which books in our New Testament were scripture communicated from God. There was widespread agreement about 
most of the books that we have in our New Testament. In 397 AD, the Council of Carthage gathered a group of church fathers and scholars. They met together and, using extraordinarily strict criteria, determined which books written since the Old Testament would be in the New Testament canon. And that leads us to the criteria for canonization. The Council of Carthage established five criteria to affirm or discover which books would be canonical. This was the, um, the first one was the criterion of apostolic or prophetic authorship. A book accepted in the Old or New Testament canon of scripture had to express very obviously within the writing or be objectively clear outside the writing that it was written by an apostle or a prophet of God. The second criterion was widespread acceptance and circulation among the early church. One of the reasons some of these other pseudo-gospels have been rejected in recent years is that they had virtually no audience in the early church. A third criterion is internal consistency. In other words, the book has theological consistency with what has already been determined and understood to be canon. It agreed with what was widely accepted as the word and the works of Jesus. It had to have an internal correspondence and a consistency with what had already been defined. Now the fourth criterion is that the text had to reflect historical accuracy. Some of the problems with the other Gospels that have cropped up in recent years is that these writings, which were written too late, contain errors regarding what we know about the history during the time of Jesus and the early church. So they do not reflect a historical accuracy. This lack of historical accuracy makes those writings suspect. The last criterion, which is more subjective, is that the book must reflect a spiritual attestation. In other words, it must reflect an internal resonance that indeed these are the words of God. Many of the early writings that did not make it into the canon were rejected because they did not reflect the kingdom agenda and lift up the person of Jesus. Instead, these writings that did not qualify as canon were written to support the idea of Gnosticism during that day or some other Greek philosophy. Their agenda was clearly not about the kingdom of God. These were the five criteria used by the councils to determine whether a book was truly canonical. The 27 books that comprise our New Testament passed with flying colors. They overwhelmingly showed most or all of these criteria, and there was little doubt. The little doubt was because there were five books that were not written by direct apostles. The Gospel of Luke, Luke's second book, the Book of Acts, the Book of Hebrews, the Gospel of Mark, and the Book of Jude. But there were other points of contact in which we knew that Luke participated with Paul in his missionary journey, and Mark had joined Peter. There was clear attestation that these books had credible authority in the life of Jesus and the growth of the early church. Now, the excluded writings, the Gospel of Mary, and this is one that Dan Brown highlighted in his book, The Da Vinci Code, it's the Gospel of Mary. Also, the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Judas, all of these writings, they failed miserably at most or all of that criteria. They were written far too late in general, most of them between 150 and 200 AD, and they were certainly too late to have been written by Mary, Judas, or Thomas. Another issue was that the books clearly spotted, I'm sorry, clearly supported a specific political or theological agenda. The Gospel of Mary is a very feminized gospel. It was clear that it was put out by a sect at that time trying to restore greater credibility to women. Nothing wrong with that, but it couldn't be part of the Bible. And there are direct contradictions between the Gospel of Mary and the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These extra-biblical writings that we have uh, were put to the same test, the same criteria for canonization, and they just fit. You can be sure that what we have today in our Bible is the very Word of God. That is, except for the Catholic Bible, which contains a collection of additional writings in the Old Testament. Now, the Catholic Old Testament has 46 books, seven more than our Protestant Bibles. So where did those extra seven books come from? These books are identified as apocryphal, which means hidden meaning. They are apocryphal writings that have gone along with the scriptures. There were rabbis and teachers that were living during the time when God did not speak, the time of silence after the last of the prophets. They were recording the history of the Jewish people, the Jewish people's longing for a Messiah, and the expectation that the Messiah would come soon. But neither the Jews nor the Gentiles during that time gave those apocryphal writings the same authority as scripture. 
and neither Jesus nor any of the other New Testament writers ever refer to the apocryphal writings. At the Council of Carthage, the canon was collated and brought together. Done. And then somebody raised their hand and asked, well, what about all these apocryphal writings? The response was, well, those are interesting books. They're helpful in some spiritual matters, but they do not contain the same weight of authority as the scriptures. And that's why they did not include the Apocrypha at the Council of Carthage. Now, let's jump forward about a thousand years to the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century. The church split. You were either Catholic or you were Protestant, or a protester, which turned into the word Protestant. Martin Luther found doctrines within the Catholic Church that he did not agree with, which resulted in the split from the Church. Luther, based on Martin Luther. It was at the Council of Trent in the mid-1500s that the Catholic Church reintroduced the Apocrypha back into Scripture and decided to elevate those writings as being equally authoritative to the Scriptures that we have today. That is where the Apocrypha came from. What we have in our hands, Bibles that we carry around, the 66 books that we treasure can be absolutely trusted for their authenticity and accuracy. We can trust those writings because they've been submitted to uh, incredible scrutiny, uh, incredible decision making, and incredible survey to understand what is understood as the Word of God and what is not. So here's my question. Does knowing about the canonization of Scripture make any difference in your life? Well, the answer is yes, it does. As I studied the scriptures this past week, I selected three words that I want to leave with you. The first word is submission. If the scriptures are canon, if they are rule of law, if they are authoritative the moment they were spoken and not when a council decided them, if they are authoritative because God spoke them, then this Bible has authority over me and I live my life in submission to it. Some people view the Bible as just a document, an ancient, irrelevant book of fables and myths that people who have nothing better to do read on occasion. That is their opinion of the Bible, and so the Bible has no bearing on their life. The Bible is under them. But there is another way that many Christians live, and that is with the Bible beside them. They would never put the Bible under them, but they put the Bible beside them. It is co-equal with them. As life goes on, situations occur, the Bible challenges their life, and sometimes conflicts with, conflicts with their life, and they negotiate with the Bible. Sometimes they win, and sometimes the Bible wins. That is a dangerous way to live. When we live with the Bible beside us, we find ourselves picking and choosing the verses that we want to believe. Mm -hmm. This is exactly what a heretic named Marcion did in 160 AD. When there was discussion during this era about what was scripture and what was not, Marcion said, I think the God of the Old Testament is just an angry elf. He just does not like people. Therefore, the Old Testament cannot be scripture. Hmm. So be it, he said. And then there are the writings of Paul. Paul is kind of strict. I do not think some of Paul's writings should be scripture. And there are some of the writings of Jesus and some of the Gospels. I do not think they are scripture. Marcion went on and on about what he thought, and what was scripture and what wasn't. Marcion's scripture, his canon, was Luke and ten letters from Paul. That's not a bad start, but he's leaving out all the good stuff. He excluded everything else because there was something in each book that he could not agree with. He subtracted from the scriptures the things that he did not like. Now you might be thinking, I can't believe that. Taking stuff out of the Bible, who would ever do that? Don't kid yourself. We do it every day. Consider what God says in Exodus. Do not hold back offerings from your granaries or your vats. You might think, well, that's the Old Testament. This idea of tithes and offerings, that does not apply to the New Testament church. And even if it did, God does not understand my economic condition right now. If it works for you, that's great, but it doesn't apply to me. Then how about this passage in the book of James? Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters. Now, James is talking to the church. Don't grumble or you will be judged. I agree that we should not grumble. That is, unless I don't like the songs we sing, or the kids can't seem to be quiet, or whatever. We say we would never rip those pages out of our Bibles, but we do it every day. We take out the sections of scripture that we don't agree with, forgetting that the decisions about what was in and out were made hundreds of years ago. If the Bible is God's words, the mo moment that it was spoken, it was not to be negotiated. 
It's over you and me, and we live under it. We believe the Bible is the Word of God and has the right to command our belief and our actions. It has the right to command, to direct, to point out, and to say, live this way. And here is the promise. If you live in submission to the Word of God, in your finances, in your relationships, in your purity, in your ethics, in your business, you will discover all the blessings that God has for you in this life. Chip Ingram, a Christian pastor, author, and teacher, and founding pastor of Living on the Edge, said this, Surrendering to God is the channel in which God's blessings flow. It's a good channel to get in. I believe that with all my heart, when we surrender and say, God, this is a tough text for me right now, but I will submit to it, that is when we begin to discover everything that God has for our life. And that leads me to the second word, which is stewardship. The second word is stewardship. It is unlikely that any of us will go home and deconstruct our Bibles or write another gospel, bury it, unearth it a couple of days later, and claim that we found some secret writing from Jesus. None of us are going to violate Revelation 22, 18, and 19. I warned everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this scroll. If anyone adds anything to them, God will add to that person the plagues described in this scroll. And if anyone takes words away from this scroll of prophecy, God will take away from that person any share in the tree of life and in the holy city which are described in this scroll. However, it is possible that we can subtract and add to scripture through misinterpretation and misapplication. That is a sobering passage, Timothy 2.15. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who quickly, I'm sorry, who correctly handles the word of truth. Do your best to present yourself to God. That's what Paul says. Don't be ashamed. Do what needs to be done. That verse tells me that when I open my Bible, it is possible for me to incorrectly handle God's word. It tells me that is a terrible thing if I do it. When people mishandle God's word, they find themselves caught up in one of two places either legalism or liberalism. Legalism is when we interpret too much from God's word and we make it say more than it was intended to say. Liberalism is when we interpret God's word too little and we make it say less than it does. It has less significance and impact on our lives. So be careful as you interpret. Reading scripture is a rich and joyful process, but be careful as you interpret and apply God's word. So I have one last word for you substitution. Every day you and I are inundated with messages that all claim to be true. If we are not careful and discerning, we are liable to substitute some of those messages for what is true. We are liable to read C.S. Lewis or Beth Moore and love them more than we love the scripture they are writing about. If we are not careful, we are liable to get more understanding about the end times from the Left Behind series than we are from the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel. If we are not careful, we are liable to get all of our skepticism and our security about the scriptures from the Discovery Channel than we are from the Word of God. All these substitutes conflict and confuse, even if they are well-intentioned. And that brings me to the free church movement. Community West, by the way, is a free church because we're not part of a Christian denomination church. The byline for the free church movement is this phrase, where stands it written? Back in the 1880s, the Evangelical Free Church of America movement was birthed from pietistic revivals that swept through Norway and Sweden. A pietistic stresses personal piety over religious formality and orthodoxy, a movement that goes back to the 17th century Germany. The principle of the statement, where stands it written, is that we believe in God and his word. For example, I read C.S. Lewis and I find something that makes me go, whoa, that's some good stuff. I stop and say, hold on just a minute. Where stands it written? How do I know that Lewis is true here? Where would I go in my Bible to find what Lewis is talking about? Where stands it written? We go to the scripture and we allow no other substitutes to direct our lives. Submission, stewardship, and be wary of substitution. Many of you know that Emmett Smith holds the NFL rushing record. Selected in the first round of the 1990 NFL Draft, he enjoyed a long career rushing for more than 18,000 yards, breaking the record formerly held by Walter Payton. He also holds a record for career rushing touchdowns with 164. There were 11 seasons when he rushed over 1,000 yards. 
When Smith was a high school freshman, he was constantly fumbling the ball. One day his coach came up to him, got in his face, and screamed, you will never be a good running back unless you hold on to the ball. And if you don't hold on to the ball, you won't stay on the team. Smith remembers that day as the day he decided to hold on tightly. Great men and women throughout history have become great because they chose to hold on tightly to something. Spiritual growth and maturity come when we hold tightly onto the scripture that was carefully guarded, carefully contained, and carefully collated over hundreds and hundreds of years. What we have today is the Word of God. Hold it close and hold it tight. Let it feed your spiritual growth. Amen.